seated. Last week, I told you I'd be doing two things. I told you I would be spending a lot of time listening and that I was working on uh, trying to understand how do we talk as a church, as a community, about success and faithfulness and how all that works together. And that was my plan for the week. And then I went home and I sat down. And I didn't get back up till uh, Wednesday. Uh, I, I, I lost a few days. And, and so the week did not go as planned. And so I do not have for you the the sermon I planned, and I did not have the opportunity to sit down and listen to every, anyone because, frankly, I don't think you want what I had. So I will get back to that, but uh, it won't be this day. This is a different sermon than you'd expected. There are times when we don't know what to say. Uh, those times tend to be when a family member is hurt, someone is sick at a funeral, something like that. We feel like we need to say something, and, and you can't just gloss over and talk about the weather how the bear is doing, something like that, because when something has happened, you have to respond. And, and so we start talking, we start saying things, you know, I'm sure it'll be okay. How often do we say that, right? I'm sure it'll be okay, everything will be fine, and, and I'm, I'm sure that God would never give you more than you can handle. And, and I'm, I'm sure if we haven't said that phrase ourselves, I'm sure that uh, we have heard it said of others. God will never give you more than you can handle. There's a certain hopefulness to it that is true, right? That, that uh, we are, we're hoping that God will continue to be involved in our lives, that we say things like this to say, remind people that God has not forgotten them. But there's a problem with it. It's the verb, right? God doesn't give people cancer. God doesn't give people tragedy. God doesn't like wrap up a horrible situation in a bow and say, oh, here, this one's for you. Right? Uh, that would make God a jerk. And that's not what we read of in Scripture. We turn to God for help because we cannot handle what happens. And we are gl glad that God is there with us when things go horribly wrong. We read in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and for that we are thankful. We read in Psalm 23 that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and we will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't say that we get to detour around the valley, but that God will be with us. And so it's not that God won't give us more than we can handle. Instead, I think what would be far more accurate to say is God helps us handle anything that comes our way. Right? That seems a bit more true. God helps us handle what comes our way. Adam Hamilton, pastor at the Church of the Resurrection, took a set of five half-truths, and he preached uh, five sermons on them, and he made a book out of them. And I'm not going to give you five sermons on them, because, frankly, I'm not sure it's worth the time. <laughs> uh, but I think, it, uh, per a, a very wise suggestion, uh, they can all be kind of put together, and, and, the, and here are some thoughts, the things that we, we say uh, and what we might say instead. Right? And it's not that any one of these, there, there's bits of truth to them, but they're problematic because they misrepresent who we believe God to be. Right? And, and this, like the idea, God won't give you more than you can handle. God doesn't give anyone cancer. It turns God into a jerk to say God is giving people cancer. And yet we say these half-truths because we've heard them before and they sound biblical-ish, right? And there's just enough truth to them that we, we don't think about them. But I, I want to go through them and, and suggest <coughs> what we might say instead. Instead of saying God will not give you more than you can handle, instead you might say God will help you handle all that you have been given. So I, I, I want to give you a better option today. Another uh, half-truth that, that we say is uh, everything happens for a reason. When do we say that? Right? You're driving through the Walmart parking lot and, and you get that mythical first parking spot that you never get that's right there and then there's the door, you pull in, you look at the person you're with and say, everything happens for a reason. Right? God loves me. God wanted me. To, or the Cubs finally win the World, World Series. Everything happens for a reason, right? We say everything happens for a reason, not when it, it's trivial or not when it, it's unexpected. We say everything happens for a reason when we're not sure if there is a reason. 
Right? When there is a tragedy, when children have died, when a disaster has struck. We, we say this because we want to claim the event as part of God's plan and sort of redeem it that way. And, and so it's, what's half true about this is the sense that God does have great power and there is much that happens for the reason that God wanted it to happen that way. Right? The sun rises because that's what God wants. Right? We are meant to live in community because that's what God wants. But what is not true is the everything part. Everything is not part of God's plan. God is not a micromanager. We have been given the ability to decide as part of being made in the image of God, and um, our decisions matter. Like, God, we talk about God as God the Father, and, and every father at some point hands the keys to the, of the, to the car to the child and says, okay, here you go. Right? And you're not micromanaging. You can't drive the car for them. You've trained them. You've raised them. You've given them a car. And now off they go. And they're going to make the decisions, hopefully wise ones, sometimes not. Right? And this is how we see God interacting with people from the very beginning. Garden of Eden. Here, Adam and Eve, have a nice place to stay. You might not want to eat over here. Bad decision. But they can decide to do it. Right? When Moses is leading the people into Israel, the Jewish people into Israel, he says to them, I set before you life and death. Follow the law. Don't follow the law. Blessings. Curse. Your choice. Right? You get to decide. Your call. Right? So we make decisions, and if they're poor ones, we suffer for them, and so do the people that we love. God is active in the world, seeking to guide us to redeem when we fall away. But that doesn't mean that everything that happens is part of God's plan. And indeed, that's what makes a tragedy so tragic, is that it doesn't make sense. That's not part of a plan. It wasn't supposed to happen. What makes evil so evil is it doesn't make sense. Remember, and so whenever we're facing tragedy, I don't think we say everything happens for a reason. I think what is far wiser and more true is to say, God weeps with you, and we don't understand. Right? God weeps with you, and we don't, we don't understand. Another fun one, God helps those who help themselves. Have we said this before? Oh, yeah. There's a real sense that this is true and that we are partners with God. We are given these great gifts to use, and uh, we need to use them well. To, give, to be given the gift of land, you have to till it. To be given the gift of children, well, they don't raise themselves. Right? Given skills, we need to refine and practice them. And if we don't, right? Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, if you don't work, you don't eat. Right? If you don't work, you don't eat. Sorry, Pro profoundly true. Right? Our faith shapes how we see the world, and we see everything we have as a, as a gift, and then we are responsible to take these gifts and to use them well. But this phrase that God helps those who help themselves is not actually biblical. Anyone want to guess where that comes from? Some of you should know this answer. Ben Franklin. Right? Ben Franklin came up with that, Little Richard's Almanac, 1736. And it is false in that we are, when do we say God helps those who help themselves? What are we about to do when we say that? You know, God helps those who help themselves, and what's the next thing you do? You don't help someone. Right? It's a rationale that we use to dismiss the biblical mandate to do our part in loving our neighbor. Loving our neighbor not in like a warm and fuzzy sense of, oh, I love having neighbors, right? But actually doing something for our neighbors. <coughs> Some, and sometimes our neighbors need our help because they have lost the ability to help themselves. They have had to do things like payday loans. Payday loans... If you get so cornered that you have to take out a payday loan, you get charged between 400 and 1,000 percent interest, and those tend to get rolled over six times. Right? That's the average. And so the amount you pay ends up being at least twice what you took out. You end up paying more in fees than you did, than, than you got in the original loan. Right? And, and it, when you are in such a situation, you cannot just help yourself. Scripture says in Leviticus 23 that you live, you leave the edges of your fields unharvested so that people can work and eat. And, and if you can imagine a nation where all of the edges of the fields are unharvested, what this is is a nationwide approach to poverty so that no one goes hungry. No one is, a, is at a complete loss. Right? There's always a way for people to work and eat. 
Right? We do not expect people to help themselves if there's not a way for them to actually get going or get ahead. Right? We don't expect pe children to work for a living before they are raised. And, and sometimes even after you've been raised, trained, and educated, you still fall down and need help getting up. It takes a nation deciding to leave the corners of its fields unharvested so that there are ways back up when people fall into poverty. I got a call about that, like, at, uh, that's the call. I got a call at the beginning of worship at 1101. I thought, who calls the pastor at 1101? It was someone who has fallen into poverty and I'm helping them transition to Section 8 housing. And I can't tell you the details, but you know, they cannot do it by themselves right now. Like they, they, they're working, right? They're working, they're trying, but this is a reminder that, that we need to be able to give people paths to get back up. I don't think we can use this idea, God helps those who help themselves, as a way to shirk of the biblical mandate to help people, to love our neighbor, to do what we can. Because often when we're saying that, what we're really saying is, I don't want to help them because I think they're lazy. I had, I, this is the conversation I had this week. Someone was talking about entitlement. And I have to tell you, I do see entitlement about one time out of eight. Right? It, people come to the church when they need help. Most of the time, it's not because they're entitled, it's because they're cornered. Right? It's simply that they're cornered and they have no way out. So instead of saying God helps those who help themselves, I think it would be far wiser and more true to say God helps people and uses us to do it. God helps people and uses us to do it. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Have you all seen that bumper sticker? Or have you seen that in, on the... On the the shirt, right? That, this is the one I've seen the least of. I, I, I know that uh, it's a song we hear every once in a while. Uh, <laughs> the Bible says a lot, and, and it continues to be the place that has everything we need for salvation. Uh, it's the most important document that exists, but it's not everything. Right? It, it is not everything. And, uh, which, it's a very bu catchy bumper sticker. Uh, it proclaims the centrality of the, the scriptures to say, God said it, I believe it. That settles it. But the problem with this, it's true, but it's not, it, it's not complicated enough, right? It, it glosses over the complexity that's in the books of the Bible, because the books of the Bible were written centuries ago in a different language, in a different culture, and it is absolutely forbidden in Scripture to eat pork. Right? Who's the major employer in this county? Right? And, and so every time we go to make pork... Every time you eat pork, right? Are you sinning against the Lord your God? No, right? That's not what we believe, right? Jesus comes, he says, he comes to fulfill the law. And then what we see Jesus do is interpret the law again and again. And that's the arguments that Jesus gets into with the Pharisees, interpreting the law. Jesus says, we can heal on the Sabbath. The Pharisees say, no, you can't work on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, the Sabbath is made for man, right? So the needs of the humanity trump the Sabbath, right? So you can heal. We are interpreting the Bible, and we continue to do this today for in situations that are far more important than bacon, even though bacon is very important. Right? We come to th things like, uh, it says at one point in, in the letters of Paul, women should be silent in church, right? Everyone? If you're a woman, stop talking in church, right? We, uh, the, God said it, that settles it, I believe it, that's it, right? No, it also says that uh, in Christ there's neither male nor female, uh, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And so we have to interpret and say that, that that is more important because it is in Christ there's neither male nor female. And that's more important than the contextual situation of what Paul says to one church in one place. So yes, women are allowed to speak in church, and if anyone ever tells you otherwise... God help them. Right? <laughs> I don't think we can say God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, because we have to say more. Right? I think it, instead, I think we have to say something like, this is God's story, written as best as could be by God's people. We read it, we study it, we try to make sense of it as best as we can as followers of Jesus, and then we try to figure out how we might live it today. And that does not fit on a bumper sticker. But it is true. The last of them is the, uh, the one we probably have heard the most. Love the sinner, hate the sin. You ever said that one? Love the sinner, hate the sin. 
God spends a lot of time explaining in Scripture what not to do and doesn't like it when we do what we should not do. Right? God does not like sin, hates sin. Right? So that's what's true about it. But love the sin or hate the sin isn't in the Bible because it has some real problems. Right? Because what's the focus? If I'm saying love the sinner, what am I focusing on? I'm going to love you, sinner. Hey, hey, don't forget that you are a sinner. Right? I, you know, I'll put up with you even though I have determined that you are a sinner. There's sort of a, an us and them motion that happens there. Like, you are a sinner and I'll endure your presence even though, let's not forget. It becomes very judgmental. Who does Jesus call us to love? Love your neighbor. Right? Loving your neighbor is a different beast and loving the sinner. And you're supposed to, we are called to love our neighbor in a very specific way. We are to love our neighbor as... So when you get up in the morning, do you look in the mirror and say that you are scum-sucking dog, you mean the worst, you're going to try to hurt people, and really I'm not sure why anyone endures your presence? I don't. You get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you say, yeah, I'm going to have a good day. Let's see how this goes, right? We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Even when I completely whiff, and I do, I know I meant well. Right? I'll give myself the benefit of the doubt. Right? To love our neighbor as ourselves is to give our neighbor the benefit of the doubt. To ascribe people's motives to the highest. And if they do whiff, then say, I, that was probably out of ignorance, not out of malice. Right? <laughs> to love our neighbor is to seek their good as well as our own and to be patient with people. And instead of loving our neighbor and hating their sin, whose sin do we focus on? Right? Do we focus on the speck in their eye or the log in our own? Right? Instead of saying love the sin or hate the sin, I think it is far more true to say just love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. I have said these five things, I'm sure you have as well, and I believe that we meant well. I don't think anyone here has said these out of any sense of malice. Right? And our intentions matter, but so does our follow-through. And I think being careful about what we say, lining up what we say with what we intend is part of what James talk, talks about when he talks about taming the tongue. We all stumble in many ways, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. We put bits in the head, in, into the horse's mouth and they obey us, and, and we, we guide ships by, by the small little rudder can guide the whole large ship. And in the same way, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Every species, beasts, birds, and reptiles have been tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. With it we bless our Lord and Father, with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And taming the tongue is not just a matter of intending well, it is a matter of speaking well. The half-truths that we have named today are those things that we say when we're having a hard conversation, when someone has encountered a tragedy, when we're trying to figure out how to respond to our neighbor who's trying to make ends meet, when we hear of someone else's sin and failing, right? How do we respond? I hope instead of being people who, who just try to speak well, we can become people who do speak well, who speak gracefully and truthfully, being good news to people who need to hear something true about who God is. Amen.